taking a walk is a great time to explore the non-dual nature of appearances. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, understand that when we're talking about the investigation of the non-dual nature of appearances, we don't necessarily need to be in deep samadhi. We don't need to be uh, meditating. Uh, we don't need to have a completely clear mind or anything like that. It's really more a matter of curiosity about the nature of appearance itself or the nature of presence itself. So let's say you're taking a walk and you notice trees or houses or clouds, and they seem to be at a distance. Now, in this uh, moment, in this practice, we can approach it from the standpoint of inquiry, asking questions. Uh, where is that? Where is that tree or where is that house or where is that car? Where is that dog or where is that uh, bush or whatever you're observing? When we ask these questions, um, we can make assumptions that there is an object there and it has a certain label. So I prefer to ask or prefer to suggest that you ask, where is that? Where is that appearance rather than where is that tree or where is that car? Because just labeling it, if there's a strong influence of mind or thought, just labeling it can kind of put it out there, can make it seem like a solid thing, an object apart from you. Rather, I would just ask, where, where is that? Where is that? And in the simplest way, we want to let that experience show us the answer, show us the answer by being exactly what it is, exactly where it is, exactly how it is. And we don't want to necessarily start to make conclusions uh, based on thought. So we don't want to start to think about it in the sense of, well, I suspect that it's 20 feet away and it seems to be out there and I'm here and my vision is uh, picking up light waves and, and receiving them and my retina is processing or anything like that. We don't want to analyze what seems to be happening from a scientific standpoint or from a conventional standpoint. Rather, we want to see what's actually occurring, what's actually appearing, and how it's appearing. So when we ask the question, where is that? Then um, we want to just remain open. Now, if we can just remain open after asking the question, open to the experience itself, not open to some mental conclusion or some imagined result. It's another thing that the mind will sneak in and try to offer you an imagined result of what it should look like, what it should happen in, in this kind of inquiry or what non-duality should feel like or be like based on someone else's descriptions. If any of that's sneaking in, just, just start again. Just ask the question, where is that? Where is that? And then just remain in the simplest, most direct, unfiltered experience that's available. Also knowing that the answer is actually there. The realization is there. It already is the case. So it's not like you're looking for something that's hidden so much as tuning into what's already there, what's already occurring. So where is that? Now, at first, this may be a process of eliminating conclusions, meaning you won't be able to help, but your mind offering conclusions like it's over there, or I know that's a solid thing. I know that's a tree. So the mind may offer those conclusions, and it may be a, a matter of eliminating those or just saying, okay, that's fine. That's a mental conclusion. That's a thought. Let me set that aside and ask again, where is this? Where is that? And you may get another answer, another sort of answer. The mind just kind of trying to reorient itself to thought and just set it aside, say, okay, that's fine. That's a thought. Where is that? Where is that? Looking for the answer only in and as the experience itself. So hopefully you get the flavor of how to approach this. Now, another thing you can do, or you can ask that question first and work with that and then work with this next question. And you can ask, where is that in relation to me? Where is that, the experience, in relation to me? And this one can be a little trickier if you, if you tend to, to get cognitive with this or if you tend to intellectualize it. 
because now you're you're actually going to reify two illusions, both the subject and the object. But if you actually are will are able to let those thoughts just settle and look and see if there's actually a relationship there. That's what we're really looking at. Is there an actual relationship? Because there are, if there are two experiences, meaning a subject here and an object out there, then they should have a relational experience. Um, uh, excuse me. They should have a relational aspect to the experience. There should be some relationship, correct? And if you look and see, is there actually a relationship? What is the relationship between that and me? Or where is that in respect to the experience of me? And don't look for a thought, just look for the experience itself. You may be able to sort of dissolve both the subject illusion and the object illusion simultaneously and see that the relational nature of appearance doesn't exist. There's no relational nature. And that the illusion of the relational nature is what made it seem like that's out there, which sort of backward extrapolates a me in here or a subject. So that's another approach is to see what is the relationship. Now, the third um, point I want to make about this, or maybe the third step, if you take this in a stepwise approach, is to see where it feels more solid. Does it feel, feel more solid out there or does it feel more solid in here? Does it feel more like that's definitely an object out there, but I'm not strongly noticing a sense of self? Or does it feel more like there's a strong sense of self here, a subject, and a, a maybe a weaker sense of object out there? Um, or you may notice it seems like both, actually. It seems like if I look out there, it seems very solid, very real, very out there. And if I look here, it feels very centered, very um, uh, contracted inward, and it feels very solid, like there's a self here. Like it could actually feel like both. Um, but I think by noticing which side of things, the subject side or the object side, feels most heavy to you or feels mo most... Um, defining of the experience, uh, then you can kind of put some attention there to sort of soften it. Put some attention and just sort of let that soften a bit and see that the solidity of the self, the contracted nature of the self, if you're able to put attention directly into that, what we call the contraction or the, so the center, and see that there isn't such a center there. And then from that, by, by kind of um, um, maybe resolving the imbalance of the relationship between subject and object for a moment um, by softening that sense of the, the subject or the sense of the object. Now you can look again and ask yourself, okay, now what is the relationship between subject and object? And by keep keeping working this way and seeing like, okay, the subject feels strong now, the object feels strong now, now they might start to both feel a little bit weaker, a little bit less obvious, less there then you can really start to look at the relationship. Well, what is causing the relationship? Maybe it's the intermittent. Maybe it's the taking turns between the sense of a subject and the sense of objects out there. Maybe we're pushing objects out there by feeling like a subject. Maybe we're defining the subject by, by perceiving objects as in an external world. And when you look and see that that relationship is, is sort of um, dynamic, actually, it's not static, but noticing what causes the sense of the relationship, you can deconstruct it. And then you can just keep asking, what is the relationship between that and what feels like me? Until you can't actually find a relationship. The sense of the me and the sense of that are not any different. They're both thoughts. But experientially, in this direct experience, there is no subject and no object. There's no inside and no outside. There's no distant and no near. There's no me and no object. Um, following those steps, and again, really making sure you're you're digesting what I said at the beginning about not answering with thought, not answering with analysis, going directly to the experience, not changing it or altering it, but trusting that the experience is already there and already exactly as it needs to be. Then as you take this stepwise approach, you may be able to dissolve that subject object relationship by seeing that there isn't one <laughs> because there is no subject and object. Let me know how that goes for you.